Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports soccer podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, NWSL analyst and broadcaster. We have a special edition interview episode for everyone today. On this episode, we are joined by special guest Meg Linehan, NWSL and U.S. Women's National Team national writer for The Athletic, joining us to discuss the recent effects involving former head coach Paul Riley and the firing of former commissioner NWSL, uh, NWSL commissioner Lisa Barrett. Meg, how are you doing today? I, I'm awake, so yep. that's a win. Um, yeah, it's been, it has been a week, but even that does not, I mean, the week has been a year. <laughs> the past few months have been a decade maybe, but I mean, it is very interesting, honestly, to finally see what happens when the story is out in the world. We, uh, we are right there with you. We at Attacking Third have, I think, recorded about a million T episodes in the span of about 72 hours, it feels like. And a quick reminder to all our followers, you can uh, follow us over on Twitter at Attacking Third. You can also head to our YouTube page and hit subscribe to never miss a new video interview or whenever we go live and you can catch great NWSL extended highlights of uh, past games that you need to catch up on. So go on over to youtube.com slash Attacking Third, subscribe and check all that up. Three of us are here together to talk about some things, maybe help us get through some things, uh, not trying to make this what could be considered a, a therapeutic episode, but sometimes talking about it sometimes is helpful. And uh, I'm really glad that we're all here together today to maybe engage our listeners a little bit on everything that's been going on. Lisa, how about yourself? How are you doing today? Um, I'm good. And I'm one of the people that like many who are listening to this or watching this that have only really been involved in it since the news broke last week. And and Meg, when you say that the last year has been a decade and, and months have been decades long and even this week has been months long, um, I cannot imagine how you're still standing and you're still awake and mentally you haven't just collapsed. So your strength is also completely commendable, but I, I'm exhausted and it's been a few days. It's it's so much still is, is yet to come, um, but I'm grateful that you're here and that we can talk about this together. And and Sandra and you, of course, are you good, Sandra? Um, you know what? I'm going to go down a limb here and I'm say this is the better day that I've had in probably since last Thursday, for sure. Uh, we're a we're a women's soccer uh, podcast, and we're not we're not chatting about like non men's soccer. We're also chatting about other pro leagues and stuff like that. And I went to a, a WNBA game, and that was actually real nice. It was actually kind of healing a little bit, and it was nice to take that in. And it was good to sort of kind of get away and get into that environment, knowing that we were gonna uh, be coming together and, and trying to talk about you know, some things today and, and just to keep our listeners engaged to briefly catch up on events in case you are coming here and you're hearing things for the first time. Uh, Meg Linehan, along with uh, Katie Strong were responsible and really did their due diligence in providing this uh, really heart-wrenching story, a really difficult read, but a very necessary article over on The Athletic highlighting and detailing uh, the stories of Sinead Fairley and Manashim and their experiences with former head coach Paul Riley, um, tough read, but encourage anyone else out there to, to head on over to Athletic, get a subscription, and take a look at the very important work that they've done for these players. And it has sort of, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, it has kind of snowballed a little bit uh, into some other things over the course of the last five days or so. And we said, that's why we really need Meg to get on here. And when we decided to bring her on, we were like, we're going to get her on here. We're going to make sure we get her on at a certain time, because there's probably going to be other things that are happening. So since the publishing of this article, Meg, there's been a number of things that have happened. The, the Players Association had a statement ready to go adjacent to the publishing of, of your article. Um, we saw multiple statements from Portland Thorns, the league, and North Carolina Kurds. The termination of Paul Riley has occurred, and... Uh, even over the weekend to seeing something uh, where the commissioner was, the phrasing of it is what we're going to get into. The, her resignation was accepted from yes. the board. And that also included the departure of the general counsel and Lisa Levine. So taking a step back, <laughs> <laughs> taking a step back, if you will, for you, 
on the opposite side of this, on someone who is the, the byline of this. Mm -hmm working to get this story out does not come easy. I would imagine it doesn't come easy. I, I would imagine that it doesn't occur overnight. No, I think talk overnight to, is. Talk to me about your process. <laughs> Listen. I mean, this, this really was months in the works, right? Like, again, kind of before we saw also everything happening with the Washington spirit, too. So it's been a really long journey. It was... I mean, hours and hours of interviews and, and going back with interviews. And, you know, obviously Sinead Farley and, and Mana Shim are, this is their story, right? This is their story. I also have to give full credit to Alex Morgan, who spoke on the record and detailed her, her role in this, not just in 2015 when she was on the Thorns, but also then in the anti-harassment policy part of this in the, the tail end of the story. But I also spoke to, I mean, I spoke to about a dozen players total and most asked for protection because there was still such fear of what Paul Riley could do, right? Like you, like I'm trying to tell the story to ensure that something happens when it is told, but when you're going through this reporting process and players are saying, you know, either I'm still in the league or I'm still in the game, or even if I'm not in this world anymore, I still feel like there could be consequences for me if my name is attached to the story. So there's just kind of this huge responsibility at play that had to be taken really seriously. And I think it wasn't just telling the stories, but it was making sure that every single part of this was reported out. All of the stuff about the culture across every single team, the, the nights out at the bar, all of these things that players spoke about making sure that I could get enough sources so that way we could feel like, yes, this is accurate. And then also the part at the very end, right? And and I've spoken about this a little bit, but just the sheer nerves of that final week of knowing, okay, we have to, we have to try to get in, in touch with Paul Riley because he also deserves a chance to respond to what we're reporting, but we have to get in touch with the NWSL for their part of it, Portland Thorns for their part of it, Western New York Flash, right? Jeff Plush, the former commissioner of the end. Of, you know, there's a lot of, of things that we have to chase down. And all of that was really within one 12 hour period, which was just a very, very, very intense day. And then waiting and hearing some like stuff, you know, like there was a player meeting late at night in North Carolina the night before the story went out and thinking, was he has he been suspended? Has Paul Riley, you know, been put under an investigation and waiting to see the results of that, that meeting the night before and no, like thinking, are we going to have to run the story ahead of schedule if something happens? But ultimately, obviously we, we were able to publish on Thursday as, as we planned, but then yeah, to see the entire result of no games. Right. But also, investigations really everywhere i mean it, it really has been i think overwhelming um not just for me obviously but for mana and Sinead as well to to see i mean just the overwhelming amount of support from players around the league and kind of that immediate reaction on thursday of this is a this is something that has to change and it has to change right now we already knew that it had to change but this was really I think a, a huge, huge breaking point for the NWSL. Taking a step back for those that aren't uh, amazing journalists that, that don't work on big stories like this, how long has, have you been working on this? How long was it planned when to release it or how that goes into it? And, and you, yeah. you touched on those nerves of how maybe it's not all going to come to come into peace how you planned it and how you wanted it to do so how long have you been working on this i mean we we've been again it's been i think probably four or five months i mean i i got to cover the olympics in the middle of this process right um so it has been a really long journey but again so much of that really stemmed from the fact that we had to ensure that the reporting was accurate which takes real time right and also it means gaining the trust of other people and and talking and trying to figure out, okay, does this one person who might have something 
that might be relevant to the story actually have something relevant to the story and trying to track that person down. So a lot, a lot of reporting time went into the story. Um, and I, I do want to point out too, that it was not just me. I, this story wouldn't exist without someone like Katie Strang, who is our lead investigative reporter at the athletic and who <laughs> I tried to get on the byline. And at, at the last minute I woke up to finding out she's not going to be on the byline. And I was like, okay, Katie, <laughs> she deserved it because also not just in terms of the additional reporting that she was able to contribute, but this is a, this is a reporter who has done this sort of thing before. And I mean, Sandra and I have known each other for a long time, but in theory, I'm supposed to be writing about soccer, <laughs> yeah. right? Like I am a, I'm a soccer writer. I'm not an investigative reporter. That is not my title. So a lot of the story also just stemmed from the fact that I have been in the space for a really long time and there were levels of trust. And, and honestly, that Monashim is a player that I covered back in 2013 in the first season of the league when she was having her breakout rookie season. And I think we just had a little bit of a connection where like, I didn't really know what I was doing. Right. And she had a lot of patience with me and I just thought that she had a very cool story. And I think that, that connection even kind of in passing helped lead to this moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think like even within that too is really, it's really important to note that kind of stuff because the length and is the length in, in producing a piece of work like this isn't just about, you know, yeah, you want to fact check and you want to make sure everything mm -hmm. is accurate. But there is all of that that comes within it. It's actually continuing to ensure that like those people that you are having these conversations with about something like protection still is in place for them when you're putting together this massive type of work and having that trust built up over time and ensuring that that trust is intact all the way through until you have the publishing date. It can yeah, be I honestly don't like, even know when that, really that publishing day got set. I couldn't even, like, I know that <laughs> I kept asking for one and kept asking for one mostly because I, I just felt like we have to, we really have to, to push on this. I mean, it, it basically, I, I don't think I wrote another story on the site for like two weeks. I just basically like dropped off the face of the planet because I was working on this pretty much constantly. And when I, the story as it ran was about 9,500 words. And that first draft was, I think, 12,000. And I mean, just even the sheer number of edits and editors that went into this process. I mean, obviously I work with, with Brooks Peck and Alex Abnos at The Athletic, but someone like George Dorman who runs our kind of big A1 program, right? Like so much work went into the story from him, but yeah, it's just, it is a long process and obviously you want it to to maybe go faster than it is, right? But also trying to juggle the actual soccer reporting too and uh, the Olympics and all of the, the lead up to the Olympics. And so there, there was kind of this understanding of this is going to be a journey that probably everyone is going to go through together, but we're going to make sure that everybody feels in the loop and, and aware of what the next step is as we go. Let's get into some of let's maybe navigate through some of these reactions post-publishing, right? Uh, the story goes live and essentially you start to sort of wait and see how something like this is received. Can I just say that posting that at 7 a.m. and being awake at 7 a.m. and waiting for people, that first like oh. two hour period was, <laughs> was just agony for me. What were you doing? Just legitimately Coffee, refreshing like, Twitter. Refreshing. Just refresh. Like I just was what were just you, waiting. What was your go-to morning beverage? Was it like I didn't have coffee that day until much later. I just was just you sitting. Probably didn't need it. In <laughs> no, I really was running off of adrenaline for a good forty-eight yeah. hours. But yeah, publishing at seven a.m. and just knowing like no one else is awake right now because everyone else is a rational human being. But I, as soon as the story goes live. <laughs> I need to, people I'm just going to be awake. awake right. Yeah. Um, so and people start and finally waking up though, like, right. It's really, as people are waking up, you could see the waves of people 
signing on for the morning, but also knowing that like Portland wasn't going to be online for a number of hours and knowing yes. that there was still a whole nother wave to go. Um, but also just kind of waiting to see, like, again, you're talking about reactions, right? Like I'm waiting, knowing, okay, I've gotten official statements from the NWSL, Portland, North Carolina, right? At least in terms of like institutions before the story runs and just kind of waiting to be like, are these going to hold up yeah. on Thursday? No, that's a good point. Like the, the structure of a news cycle, right? Mm -hmm. how quick it is in this new <laughs> millennium that we're all navigating together. Um, just how quick it is, like the concept of like a 24 hour news cycle that sort of feels like it's maybe composed of like three different parts of a day. Yeah. And like, I think we saw that with, with this story a little bit, like this sort of like very early reaction, this like post wave of like West Coast reaction, right? And then then it was just sort of like everybody at the same time finally got to the same point and we're just like sitting with it mm -hmm. uh, all day. And then it kind of, it sort of felt like the day sort of ended with all of those statements from, you know, from the places that people were expecting them to come from, whether it was the Thorns organization, um, the league, North Carolina, the, the result of just a full termination of, you know, Paul Riley at that time that, uh, that waiting weighs weighs heavy, but I would imagine even watching all of that come in can can weigh heavy. Because that's the other part of this too is like I don't think people realize that you know watching all of this unfold. That this isn't like uh, you know this isn't like trauma entertainment that people like enjoy going through. This is like very difficult. This is very emotionally draining and straining on people. Whoever is doing the reporting and the violence on it. Something of this magnitude is massive. And watching that reaction come in, I would imagine was quite difficult at times because some of it was reaction and response. Like some of it was like, oh, read this, read this thing. It's a very great important thing. But within that, it was also like, I am wrecked. <laughs> right. No, and obviously I've I've had time to kind of sit with the emotions and and not to say that, I mean, I absolutely cried on Thursday. I think at multiple points, there was one point where I was on the zoom for OL rain and I asked a question and Jess Fishlock started her answer by thanking me. And I was like actually quietly crying whilst trying to be quiet because I was still unmuted on the zoom and I didn't want anyone to realize that I had finally kind of cracked at least for a few minutes. Um, so there was that part of it, but I also think that, you know, and I think we've spoken about this for a while, but just in terms of being in this space, right? Like I have been around this league since it started. I've been around women's soccer in some form kind of off and on since 99, right? I This work is not something that I take lightly and knowing that there are very likely to be very significant changes and very heavy changes after this story gets published, but knowing, right, that this story has to be told and it has to be reported well and thinking, okay, what comes next, right? That's a, that is a, an emotional part of it as well of just thinking, what am I, what am I, what, what am I opening up here? It's and, an and, unsettling and scary place to be. And sure. you've been doing this research and, and this work for months. And then it, honestly, now when the story was published, that's when the real public work almost begins when, when action can actually be taken. And what, I mean, besides of being the voice for these players and to make this story public and really known uh, to the world, what is what was your point? What did you, what do you want out of this besides just that? Like, give me your hopes for for the results of all of this. I mean, I think one of the most important parts of the story is really talking about the culture of women's sports, right? And I think I I have gone through my own <laughs> frustrations honestly over the past forty eight hours too in terms <laughs> of the way that this has been covered and and even you know that before. Um, 
the, before this published knowing, right? Like, I mean, I even go back to thinking about 2016 or whatever year it was, Sandra, I don't know if you remember this, but I'm sure you do. The Western New York flash playing on that tiny baseball field. Right. And watching that story spread and watching yeah. everyone cover that story that had never covered women's soccer before. Yeah. And it was like the laughing stock of the sports world for a good news cycle. Right. Like, and knowing, okay, I'm working on this and thinking about, okay, what comes after? Because we're going to get media attention in this space like we never have before. But A, to be fair, it deserves it. It deserves that attention and it deserves that light and it deserves this coverage because this is going to be, I hope, a major story. But at the same time, knowing that this is, I'm grappling with some same version of what the players are grappling with of this pressure to stay silent because any negative attention throws the entire league into jeopardy. And knowing I am opening that door. And so now to be on the other side of it, I think there is some frustration. And I, I am unfortunately not exactly a patient person. I, <laughs> that is that is my one of my main character flaws, along with being stubborn as hell. And so for me today to kind of, you know, we're starting to see people show up with, with opinions that are not informed by real knowledge of women's soccer, the NWSL, the space, kind of the work that needs to happen. And so this is my test now. And I think part of why I feel such a responsibility of, do I want all of these eyeballs on women's soccer? Yes and no. Am I, I feel a responsibility for as we're getting coverage of the story to try to help and be involved with it, because I think it will give a better viewpoint and nuanced understanding of the moment that we are actually in as a sport. That's also like the tough side of looking at these reactions, right? Post-publishing, because you do have those, you you have the reactions where it's directly from players, you know, current, past, you know, former, present, maybe even future, you know, young soccer players who were watching all of this stuff, you know? unfold um but then you do start to see that right in the development of a new cycle right this sort of this sort of weird uh you know disaster doomsday parachuters coming on in and wanting to make sure that they also uh, have a piece or a say you know in in everything that's going on right now um but that's like the i think maybe this next phase of things where we're at where you see you're, you're here you are standing in this doorway and I think that's sort of maybe sort of feels where we're at right now. It sort of feels like I'm on, and this is an I feel statement. I'm, I'm sort of feeling like I'm I'm waiting for everybody else to hurry up and file whatever it is the hell they want to file, so that they can continue to hurry up and leave just as quickly as they came in. Um, and I understand that that could possibly be like a dangerous perspective to have, but it is incredibly frustrating to watch all of these things happen. I'm, I'm more curious to see whether or not all of these, uh, you know, all of these perspectives and these op-eds and these other opinion pieces that are coming in will lead to perhaps more coverage down the line, which is, I think you and I have had multiple conversations about it. We both agree <laughs> is necessary you know, for like the sustainability of the league, you know, right. and then you have uh, sectors of, you have sectors of, of viewership or sectors of fandom who maybe look at it as like, it's all bad. <laughs> it's bad that this came out and it's bad that everyone else is, is talking about it. So there's just, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of different angles uh, to, to come at it. But I think, a very important one, I think that we maybe should narrow in a little bit here is is that this very, very tough week that the league had in in the media, starting with, uh, you know, Washington Spirit and sort of talking about the conclusions of those investigations and handing out uh, consequences there, and then having to go through this with Paul Riley and multiple clubs there to now sort of seeing all of this happening in the middle of a year where Meg, we've heard a lot about the player side of things in regards to the association 
and their ongoing negotiations for CBA. So a week like this that sort of propels the league into uh, headlines that they are absolutely unused to. I won't even say unprepared for. They are unused to this type of lens on them. Um, what is sort of your perspective on the Players Association and how they have been trying to navigate through this this tough week? Yeah, I think they, they've been on Zoom a lot <laughs> to start with, right? Um, you know, I think, I think it was really smart of them for them to ask for the games to be postponed instead of making that decision, right? Like put this back on the owners because fu fundamentally, right. We're looking at people in power and what decisions have been made along the way. So a lot of what has happened this week has been with at, at the feet of NWSL ownership more than anything that the players have done. That's for sure. So the players shouldn't be responsible for this decision. And I think obviously there is still a huge amount of work, but to see that very strong statement from the players association to know also the, this is like really honestly barely touched in the story, but there is such a huge story behind how the anti-harassment policy actually even got put into place. And, and so much of it really comes from both the players association being involved there and pulling it out of CBA negotiations because they realized it was so important, but also that direct pressure from Alex Morgan, right? Which came because she knew the stories of Mana Shim and Sinead Farley. So knowing that players are accurate when they're saying we only get things when we agitate for them, right? And then seeing on Thursday or the difference between the statements on Wednesday and then what's happened on Thursday and Friday. And part of that coming from players, again, having these clear demands of needing the league to be better. But I also think that there is a part of this is where the players need to actually start playing again too, right? We, we do still have a season to finish. I think that there is, as you've kind of said, a lot of kind of doom and gloom hanging around about the league surviving or, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot still to figure out in terms of fallout. But fundamentally, I think the NWSL, and I, I, I keep trying to hit this note because I think it really is important. There are the players of the league who are actually the heart of this league. You do not have the NWSL or women's professional soccer, whatever you want to call it as an actual thing in this country without the players, but the structures that govern these players have largely been built by men, by male owners over the course of the past decade or so by U S soccer when they came in and, and Canada soccer and also Mexico as well, you know, in terms of how this league was structured off the bat. And we can, I think, effectively separate the players from the institution. And one of those things truly deserves to not just survive, but thrive. And we get to figure out and take a look at the institution and figure out what is working, what is not, what have we copied that we truly do not need? What do we actually need? Also, and this is probably a whole other podcast, why is the NWSL front office in the past so intent on making itself into an NFL type of entity instead of WNBA type of entity, right? Like, what are we actually prioritizing here? Because right at the moment, it just seems to be growth for the sake of growth rather than something that will actually benefit the players. There's a lot. There's a lot to think about. But fundamentally, I think the players are kind of now at the heart of this movement. And that's, I think the goal here now is to, to follow their lead at this point in time. There's so many different avenues I want to take right now with everything you just said. Uh, one of them, I'm going to ask you point blank. We, we knew that the games were canceled uh, this past weekend or postponed, excuse me, whatever they were. I mean, we're going to find out, I guess. Whatever the specific <laughs> wording is around that, which I don't think anyone was truly surprised by, by hearing that announcement. Um, but there are midweek matches coming up. And, and like you said, there's a season to be finished. Will they play this week and, and next weekend? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't heard anything definitively one way or the other, but I do think that the players need a time this weekend, and I, I'm honestly very, very glad that everyone got the week, especially in just in terms of how much news we are still getting by Sunday night, right? We just got this news of who's going to lead U.S. soccer's investigation, which is a name I started texting words that can't be said on a podcast uh, just in terms of sheer reaction because it's, it's Sally Yates, right? Like, so we're still getting so much new information that to even potentially play the games this weekend would have been just an absurd, absurd idea, right? But I think by Wednesday, I think I've even kind of seen the shift within like women's soccer Twitter of, I think we've moved past maybe the processing part and now people are into the more traditional uh, women's soccer Twitter space of both severe disappointment, but also willing to start getting in some jokes, which I think is honestly probably a good healthy thing for this space. Um, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be us without, <laughs> without, without the memes, right? So the memes and the jokes. <laughs> yeah. So I think it is probably good. Like, I think people are starting to now think about, okay, what, what comes next right and honestly i think part of that is the return of games because it's also going to give players a direct path to talking to fans in some fashion right whether that's via t-shirts or pro you know something yeah. at games or via the media after game like we're going to be having a lot of conversations and the the best possible path to having those honestly is to have players actually doing their job at this moment I think that's also like a big uh, a big part of this that I think is important for people to try to reel themselves back in and sort of get back into to that lane because a lot of I mean we're talking about responses and and reaction to this type of stuff and we saw like over the weekend uh, a massive protest in front of Portland Thorns and Providence Providence Park Stadium uh, signs smoke the whole nine very 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 impressive talk about organizing and utilizing your voices to be heard, which has rolled over into a MLS game, a Timbers mm -hmm. match. Um, you know, and we're starting to see those signs, you know, calling for general manager Gavin Wilkinson to, to, to be removed and uh, continuing to sort of see these, these types of things roll over into, into these areas. But I think it's uh, that's an important point that you do bring up because I mean, in bringing up the players and just the player reaction specifically and tying that into the association and their own appropriate responses and, and reactions throughout this week is that's a huge part of it. Like, is there, are we seeing now this sort of these, these con these conceptual things of like, you know, burn it and built it back up. I think it's important for people to hang on more to the latter part of that phrase and say like these players probably want nothing more than to have a safe environment in which to do just that play. Also, they would, I, I don't think anyone would like to lose their job within the next week. Right. Like that's, that's, I think an, another important part of, of just that, again, this whole concept of one bad story tears the whole thing down. Right. And, and so Again, that's why I think it's so important to separate this idea of the NWSL, the institution, from the games that are actually going to be happening. Because there are, for as many bad actors as we might have within the system, there are good people within this league from a staff point of view, obviously from a player point of view, right? Like there, there is something at the heart of this that is still good, <laughs> Like that's the only word I can come up with is that, that is still good. No, it's because it's, it's a simple way to put it, but that's that's true. I mean, but we're that, we're seeing that we're seeing that we're seeing the good within all of the smoke. <laughs> right, is, is the best is the best way to put it. No, like does the NWL need to? You know, obviously there was already this whole intention of oh, we're going to go through this rebranding process ahead of the 10th season, right? Mm -hmm. Like, this is this is going to be a conversation for later of, does the NWSL name need to exist, right? Like, if we are kind of taking apart the house as we're still trying to live in it and rebuild it in a better fashion, right, does it 
does the name change? Does the look of it change? Right. But you can't just throw a new name on it and say, we've, we fixed it. Right. Like that's, that's a part of it. Yes. There might be a new branding exercise and all that kind of stuff, but you have to do the work before you get to reward yourself with like the nice new merch at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's, that's the process that we've got to go through first of this question of does the NWSL as a structure, whatever deserve to exist? Like maybe like, does this league actually shut down? I don't think so. Does this league change drastically over the course of the next calendar year? I think absolutely. Before that, uh, we get to the hopeful change, and and you mentioned the rebuild of it and how it's necessary to happen. When you look at the league, um, let's just say this year, for for example, at a macro level, what is the structure of it? Who is made up of the league front office? Who is in charge? Who sits at those tables? Um, now this year, before we even look to the future of what could happen, what does it look like right now in this this year that we had? Welcome to the challenge of uh, NWSL transparency, but general structure, right? So there is an NWSL league front office, which in theory is a commissioner, right? General counsel, Lisa Levine. Um, there's a person in charge of like player operations. So like the trades and all that sort of stuff. There's, you know, a general operations person. Um, God bless her, like the schedule, all of that sort of stuff. There is a chief revenue officer. And then there's a communications staff as well, right? So like there's content people as mm -hmm. well. But the the league front office is pretty bare bones still, even at this point within within the league. Um, and now obviously it has changed drastically, which we can circle back around to. But there's also the NWSL Board of Governors, which is basically every single team in the league has a seat. And in theory, the owner could sit on this board, but they can also appoint someone else. So for instance, let's let's skip ahead. So now, currently, as of Sunday, the league is being overseen or the front office is being overseen by this new committee stemmed from the Board of Governors. So that's Amanda Duffy mm -hmm. from Orlando, Sophie Savage, and I really hope I'm terrible with French names, so I deeply apologize if I got that wrong, but she is the, the board seat for the Rain slash OL group from France. And then Angie Long from Kansas City. So all three of them are board representatives on this board of governors. And there's not exactly a lot of transparency about who's sitting in any board seat at any given time. And who's on, they also have committees. None of those are really ever publicly available. Sometimes you'll hear like, oh yeah, there's the the commercial committee or the this committee, you know, like there's kind of a game rules stuff. So like the recent expansion rules have to be designed and voted on by the board of governors. Though, again, we could get into a whole sidetrack about how those should probably be governed by a collective bargaining agreement with the players, but we'll, we'll set that aside for the moment. Um, there's just so many layers here. There's also so much layers of, I made a quick reference to this, but like there's internal politics too, of like you mm -hmm. have kind of factions within the board, right? Which makes sense because you have expansion groups coming in. You have teams that are independent. You have teams that are MLS backed. People have different priorities, different approaches to the league. So of course there's going to be internal politics. Um, Looking at today and, and the yeah. news that happened on Sunday of this weekend is that the NWSL announced the formation of a committee committee following mm -hmm. Lisa Barrett's resignation. So who, who appoints these people Um after who forces Lisa Barrett <laughs> great, out. Great, also, great. Like well, so I would assume the board had to vote for Lisa if they were going to accept her resignation, right? Again, to get back into that language thing of how that exactly played out. Um, you know, that's a board decision. And I think generally board decisions are made by simple majority, as far as I know. Um, so basically the teams are, are taking a vote of like, do they have confidence in Baird or not? How they named those three, they have not shared that information. Um, but I would assume that they prioritized obviously naming women in terms of like who was sitting on the board and who, you know, it does seem like they prioritized relatively recent additions mm -hmm. to the board since obviously there is kind of this now history that we are grappling with 
from the NWSL, Amanda Duffy from Orlando, obviously served as president of the NWSL before going to Orlando. And her role then, I would argue, honestly, she was not a commissioner. We, we Let's get it on the record. Folks. Yeah, she was not she was not a commissioner. She was not honestly empowered very much yeah. in that time period. Um, so, I mean, I think that there are I, I personally am very interested because I also think Amanda Duffy over the past whatever year or two has really shown that she can excel in a team environment with the Orlando Pride in terms of that turnaround of that team. And I think that she has grown a lot over that time period. And I think learned a lot. So I'm, I'm honestly really interested to see her perspective at this moment in time, because she does have kind of a sense of some of these internal workings of the board in a way that the other two might not. Um, I think it is a little concerning. I, there, there were opportunities for them to find a former player that is in the ownership role via Angel City, but if they are specifically going within board of governors, I think it does. They don't really have a choice on that front, but you know, the question is, could you, could you name someone outside of an actual board, a, a person with a, a vote on the board of governors, but yeah, there, that is going to be, you know, and, and in theory, we're also now in a, at the start of a global search for the next commissioner. Looking at this from really an outsider's fan perspective that just comes to watch the game and watch the sport, you mentioned earlier that the this is a great chance for the league to rebuild. And instead of trying to be like an NFL front office, maybe try to be more like the WNBA office. What do you mean by that? Who um, not just prioritize naked profit <laughs> over everything. Honestly, I mean, that kind of sums it up, right? Yeah. WNBA, I think, has really shown, first of all, they have a very good uh, collective bargaining agreement with the WNBA Players Association that I think both sides were satisfied by, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that they have shown as a league that they are not afraid to lead from a place of politics and inclusion and any number of things. Right. And I think, you know, Sandra and I have been covering this for a while. It's not just that we need to worry about safe workplaces from a, from a point of view of sexual harassment or verbal abuse. There have been number of instances in terms of black players, not feeling safe within mm -hmm. this league. I mean, I, I wrote a story and asked players uh, right in it following George Floyd, do you feel safe in every NWSL stadium? And the answer is no, right? So there's a number of issues here that still really need to be addressed. I mean, I think about the conversations I had, even with Lisa Barrett, about the playing of the national anthem and how that was approached, right? There have been frustrations on a number of fronts for a while. And I think in addition to the NWSLPA, the, the Black Players uh, organization within the league is also, I think, I, I hope to see them step forward and and hopefully provide a list of things that they would like to see because there are improvements that need to happen across the board when it comes to safety for a number, a number of factors for these players. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think I'm with the new cycle having progressed the way that it is. That's where I'm, the lane that I'm settling in, where it's not just about the failed systems that have been in place and the men's in position of power who have maybe abused those things or allowed things to fall to the wayside. But we're sort of getting into the areas of what it looks like to rebuild and what that rebuilding is going to, the, the shape that rebuilding is going to take place moving forward. And we just really can't forget that, especially when we're talking about safe environments. We're talking about what kind of safe environment and for who. And what does that look like? So good energy. Yep. But what are we talking about when we're talking about non-white players? And what does that energy look like? And what does it feel like? So these are all things I think that are hopefully going to continue to be part of this this rebuild moving forward or this restructuring of things moving forward. Um, I mean, it's appropriate that we're sort of tying these things together as we're talking about this new committee being formed and then moving forward. I mean, that was one of the biggest things I think somebody like me takes notice of 
right away. There's a lot of, and there was reaction to that as well. And like there was the reaction of like, oh, it's women. And then for some people looking at this, it's like, oh, it's all white women. Right. And it's kind of like, okay. So it's like, where, where, <laughs> which lane and which angles and, and who is doing what here? Yeah. But you also look at the board, right? And again, we don't really know who's on that, but I don't, in terms of gender breakdown, we don't really know, but I I would be shocked if there were a person of color on that board, truly. Well, I know we'll be keeping an eye on it, Meg. We'd like to do that. We'd like to do, we'd like to do that. We'd like to take a look at it. Um, buddy, I appreciate you coming on as always. You could have you could have said, No, I need to sleep. <laughs> you didn't, you didn't tell you didn't tell us that. I appreciate you coming on and letting us chat with you a little bit about this very, very chaotic type of week that you've had. I'm sure there will be additional news uh, you know, stemming from it. That's the area that we're all in right now is sort of the post reaction in the post. What does it all mean and what does it look like moving forward? So uh, this was nice to just sort of have this conversation with you and also just check in with you because I care about you and I'm glad that you at least appear to be holding up. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. I, I will say my boss today was like, I might force you to take a day off this week. And I was like, you will have to force me. So I, I, I bless you. If you make that call on me, I will not fight you, but you're going to have to force me. <laughs> I mean, in the meantime, I'll just keep lighting the candles. You know me. <laughs> I want to thank everybody here for listening uh, today and joining us as always. I want everybody to go out there, primarily follow Meg for news on Twitter. At it's Meg Lenahan. You can also follow us on Twitter as well uh, at Attacking Third. Uh, we're also available as a video, so you can head on over to YouTube. So hit youtube.com slash Attacking Third, subscribe. I want to let everyone know if you go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher for your shows, uh, that you can actually leave us a rating, and that'll be very, very helpful. Uh, if you leave us five stars and you leave us a question, Lisa and I might answer that in our mailbag segment. I don't know. It depends on the question. We'll take a look at it. But uh, for everybody... For everyone here today, myself, Sandra Herrera, Meg Linehan, Lisa Roman, this was a technical.